I can go on and on about Lauren and, you know, so many different memories and like all the years that we spent together. I do want to say that Lauren, before her passing, like within the last couple of years, she became more spiritual with herself. I feel like that gives me some type of acceptance that her soul is okay because here she was trying, but Lauren was never the one to take drugs. Like absolutely not even marijuana, like absolutely nothing like that. She never needed it. Like, honestly, she, the girl was just a ball of life. Like she was what, you know, what people would say high off life. I've been in media for so long, I might be a little desensitized to really uh, caring if somebody is going to pick up a story or because I'm so used to it being ignored. So sometimes it takes us building our own platforms and making our own space and creating our own tables for um, our stories to be told. Smithfield's 24th birthday. Year old but Lauren Smithfield was found dead in her Bridgeport, Connecticut apartment after going. I have an update for you guys Smith in regards to the case of Lauren Smithfields and Brenda Roth. So I first heard about Lauren Smithfield's case back, uh, I think it was like mid to late December, and it was actually a follower had asked me to look into it. You know, what immediately struck me was how little information there was. This was a woman who had died under mysterious circumstances, but they were talking about how the police said that they weren't looking into the guy that was last with her. And that just really, it honestly just really irked me and made me really angry. And so I decided to post about it and share all the information that was out there, which was you know, close to nothing. Please share Lauren's story. The more attention this story gets, the more likely the Bridgeport Police Department will do a proper investigation and get Lauren's family answers. We know that some scenes are just failed because the officers on scene didn't realize that there was something going on. But when you have a scene that is so clear, this is a stranger. It's inside of her home. There is questions about the scene. I don't understand why you wouldn't. And the only thing I can say is it leads exactly what we've always been talking to, which is the officers on scene are not taking black women seriously. They just thought of her as, well, it must be an overdose. <laughs> is there anything about her case that stood out to you? Something that surprised you at all? After Gabby Petito's disappearance and all of the conversation around the lack of equitable coverage, I was hopeful going into the future that maybe we'd see some differences in coverage. And so for me, seeing Lauren's case, it was, um, it actually hit me pretty hard to see that social media was so far ahead of the mainstream media because it was a really stark reminder of how far we have left to go when it comes to the missing white woman syndrome. The missing white woman syndrome is a term that was coined by um, the late and amazing journalist Gwen Ifill, and it essentially refers to the fact that the media overrepresents stories about white missing women and girls compared to missing women and girls of color. Um, I never set out for our black girls to be an organization or a nonprofit. I just wanted to do something to add my voice to a cause. Um, as I saw these girls and these women that look like me, they look like my friends, they look like my family members. Historically, Black women have not been seen as full people. I mean, even as simple as going to the doctor and saying that you're in pain, as simple as the mortality rate when it comes to um, pregnancy and birth within Black women. Our pain, our voices are often the last. Even when it comes to dating, if you talk about dating apps, we're the, most, we're the least desirable. Take me back to the moment when you first heard about Lauren's case and why were you compelled to become involved? Um, I thought it was important to be involved in a case like this because um, I I'm living in an era where 
um, black lives aren't valued the same as white lives. Um, and I mean that from a systemic standpoint, not from my neighbor or friends that I know who are white or other or from other races, but systemically, um, whether it's implicit biases or straight out racism, it's something that devalues our lives. So when I heard how her daughter was just disregarded, et cetera, um, I said I was all in. So um, I signed up right away and um, we've been working ever since. So according to the autopsy report, Smith died of acute intoxication due to the combined effects of fentanyl, alcohol, and prescription medication. What does Lauren's family want us to know about her? The mother wants, you know, the biggest misconception about this case is this implication that she was using drugs. The idea that the, um, the, the idea that the medical examiners will say this was an accidental overdose leads people to believe that she was using drugs and just took too much. That's a misconception. She wasn't using drugs and took too much. She doesn't use drugs. And so you get some negative people saying, oh, that's what it was. She, she was just a drug user. And now they're saying it's race. No, that's not right. Um, and aside from that, she wants you to know that her daughter was beautiful, ambitious. She was in college studying to be a physical therapist. She was just a great kid. And she's a kid. That's, that's what it was. She was 23. Can you talk about the ideal victim stereotype and explain the treatment of white victims versus black and brown female victims by the criminal justice system? So when I think about the ideal victim stereotype, I think it's important to point out that in the United States, we actually have a very long history of white women and girls being viewed as the ideal victim. Um, the ideal victim is essentially a person or a group that when they are victimized, they're believed to be innocent, blameless, and deserving of protection. And in essence, the ideal victim is somebody who is worthy of our collective attention, but is also viewed as worthy of the collective resources as well. So in my research, we found that women who do not conform to this ideal victim stereotype do tend to be shown as being somehow responsible for their victimization. So some examples of victim blaming statements might be that they're using alcohol or drugs or that they're dressed in a particular way, or maybe that they have associations with people that have an arrest history. There is some research out of the Pointer Institute that actually shows that most people engage with news stories through the photograph, the headline, and the caption. And so something that really struck me in some of the stories about Lauren is that she was framed in a photo of her with a bikini, which I think is just um, so striking on so many levels and, and in this case, so inappropriate to what the story is actually about. And you know, research shows that um, women of color are often um, sexualized in ways that um, white women are not. And I think that that was a very clear example of that. So social media, specifically TikTok and Instagram, have been instrumental in bringing national attention to Lauren's story and keeping it alive. The rapper Cardi B was also instrumental in raising awareness about the case and that her tweeting about it was significant. Would police have taken this case seriously had social media and celebrities like Cardi B not gotten involved? Um, you know, absolute answer is no. You know, with Gabby Petito, um, the national media um, should be ashamed of themselves because they they parking they, they went right after the story her story and they wouldn't stop it was it was relentless CNN etc um, and they said to us uh, said to me if it wasn't for social media or what role did I think social media played and my answer is clear social media was like Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad you had to do whatever you had to do to get to the freedom that you were seeking. So if these national media companies didn't take us seriously as they did Gary Petito, we started underground with TikTok and social media. It was only when, when we got those followers that the big giants like CNN and the rest of them start calling us. You, you, you could bet your bottom that if it wasn't for the groundswell in social media and the underground um, movement that we started, they wouldn't call us. I think that TikTok is unique in its algorithm and the way that videos can go viral. I mean, I've literally seen products sell out because of a viral TikTok video. So I just don't think it would have reached as many people 
had it not been for the TikTok videos that went viral about it. And, and I, I think that if it hadn't reached that many people, I mean, maybe they would have done a criminal investigation, but I don't think the whole uh, internal affairs investigation into the detectives, I don't, I honestly don't think that that would have happened because it would have just been the family who was outraged, not so many people around the world. In your ideal world, what would justice for Lauren look like? For us, justice can never really be achieved until we stop losing young girls like Lauren. I know here on earth, she was a very good soul. So I know in the afterlife, God needed his angel back, obviously. Like he just wanted her back. So I think that gives me peace of mind that, you know, she was very in tune with herself. So I know she's okay.